we should talk probably a little bit about social security reform in this video just because it is it is okay. a really big part of the equation that whenever we're talking about our deficit we're not talking about social security right because right now social security it, it is it is running a huge deficit but it's made up for the fact that they have all these savings they have a huge trust fund we're heading towards a point 15 years or so where social security is heading towards a 20 percent automatic cut and so we don't want that to happen and so the only way we can keep those benefits going is our our, our deficit explodes at that point in time which we don't want that either so what do we think about how we fix the social security well, i mean issue? like statutorily i don't believe uh, we're allowed to use deficit money to spend on social security. And so in, that's why you said you have these automatic cuts that will come in where if we ever have a scenario where social security is like scheduled to pay out more than we take in, in terms of revenue for the program, then benefits just get cut automatically. Like the sort of principal adjustment. Look, the fortunate down. thing here is that when the 20% cut happens, the Republicans lose 40% of their seats um, when they decide to stick with the austerity budget and the Democrats just raise yeah. it and the deficit. Triggers. Well, I, so, I mean, I, truthfully speaking, yeah, like, I, 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 you know, in 2036 or, you know, whenever this will really come to a head, um, if it does come to a head, if we don't solve it before then, um, I think, honestly speaking, like whether you're a Republican in office, whether you're a Democrat in office, whether it's a Republican dominated government as a whole or a Democratic dom dominated government as a whole, um, they're just going to fix it when it comes to a head. Like, I think what will end up happening is they're going to remove the cap on uh, payroll contributions to where payroll taxes are truly progressive. That solves like three quarters of your problems if you don't adjust the formula at that point. Like just taxing every dollar the same on payroll and not capping at it. Because for people that don't know, at a certain point when you make a, it's inflation adjusted. So I think right now it's like $150,000 a year. If you make more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, let's say that you make five hundred thousand dollars a year, every dollar that you make above one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you pay zero payroll tax on. So you contribute nothing into Social Security for that entire like three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of income. And so, just eliminating that cap, um, we used to have a same cap for Medicare. I believe Clinton reduced it based Clinton, I guess. Yet again, fiscal sustainability. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, um, it was great. Yeah, and so like um, we've eliminated the cap on Medicare. We can do the same thing for Social Security. That's three quarters of your problem right there. And then and from then there you, you can the do. Space. Um, yeah, I mean you you could rate. I mean whatever you wanted to do, right? You could do alternative forms of taxation. You could raise the payroll tax. Um, I think at the end of the day, Social Security is just such a beloved institution by so many people. Elderly people vote so disproportionately to younger people. Everyone's gonna get completely shit on, despite what your party is, if you let. Social Security benefits be cut by 10, 20 percent. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, taxes are just going to go up to pay for it. And again, like for people that are scared about that, like the last thing that I'll say is that's just a good thing. Look, I'm OK paying more taxes so that elderly people don't live in poverty. And that's just a calculation that everyone should be willing to make from a moral perspective. But also empirically, again, it, it does reduce elderly poverty to a great extent. If you were be if you were to be against such a thing, you would be in favor of immediately putting millions of elderly people into poverty which uh, you know is of course nothing that any moral person should want right right so like in, I in my one last point on the immigration yeah. uh, a bit again like if you want to increase payroll taxes one way is to simply have more people paying those taxes so yeah that's the, the cheat code right so like the whole timeline security, simply have more young people the whole timeline just gets way more favorable if you have better demographics and the demographic situation we have right now is like a really bad one but we could have a better one. It's a policy choice. So we could simply policy choose to have one more immigrants and two do a lot of basic research for cloning pods for some reason. Yeah, um, I think this is actually something that we that, that that we might all agree on, right? We talk about social wealth funds. We're not going to get just a general social wealth fund, uh, probably, especially if we don't solve the deficit situation. It would just seem weird for us to have any political movement for that, or even for that to make a lot of sense. That there's not really a basis for that anywhere else in the world. But social security. It's had a social wealth fund. It's had a huge social security trust fund. And, and people, when they think about social security, they, use, they usually think that when you pay your taxes, you contribute to social security, they invest your money, and they give it to you whenever you retire. And that's how it ideally would work. That's what we call a front-loaded system. It is now a pay-go system. My taxes go to fund current beneficiaries. And that's where you get all of these, you know, if the demographics, if there's too many old people, not enough young people, you have this imbalance. The return on your social security contributions is pretty low, right? They yeah. call it a Ponzi scheme. And so I, I'm, I'm, I want to write an article at some point about this, how we fix social security for good. We make it a social wealth fund. It, it sh it, and in order to do that, we need to be able to accrue a huge surplus in social security 
So much so that we reach a point in time in which we can pay off all of our debts to current generations, current eligible people, so that we can start saving everybody's current contributions to pay them back out to that generation in the future. And how do you do that? Well, first, we, un we uncap the payroll tax. Second, we expand it. You know, we make sure it's, it's taxing uh, health insurance benefits, at, at, you know, lunch plans, all of the benefits that employers provide. That, that fixes a lot of the problem. When we talk about cuts, Republicans love to talk about cuts, and they love to talk about the worst possible cut you could do, which is raising the Social Security age. They never like to mention that the Social Security age just ended being raised. We've been raising the Social Security age slowly over the past like 20, 30 years. It's now 67. That's high by international standards. And it doesn't make any sense because people in this country are still retiring at 63, 64 for women, 65 for men. And what's happening? They're just not getting Social Security or they're claiming their benefits early. So we're basically cutting their benefits. And so the reality is, yeah, life expectancy has gone up. It hasn't gone up that much. And also it's only gone up for higher income people. If you're poor, Latino, poor and black, poor and white, your, your life expectancy has not gone up that much. So raising the social security age just means you're throwing a bunch of people into poverty. Uh, if you, if, I think the only kind of cuts that we could talk about with social security is one, using a more accurate inflation measure. We use normal CPI that overestimates inflation. So using chain CPI would, would stop overestimating, uh, overestimating inflation. I think that's reasonable. And second, you could talk about the social security formula. Economy, you mentioned this earlier, right? We have, a, we have an income-based Social Security formula where the more you pay in, the more you get out. I don't think that we're going to get a flat benefit at any point, anytime soon, although that might be a good idea, but you can make it more progressive. Right now, some people on Social Security are getting a benefit of $900, $800, and so they're still in poverty. How, what do y'all think about the proposal of maybe reducing the amount rich people get, you know, making it where they still get more, but it's smaller? And then setting the minimum Social Security benefit equal to the poverty line so that nobody that is eligible for Social Security is in poverty. Yeah, I mean, I, I, actually, I, go ahead. I, I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, I, I pretty much like all of those ideas. I mean, it's, it's hard to really come away thinking anything else, I guess, right? I mean, yeah, sl switching to a flat benefit is, is simpler and it's more intuitive. Um, also, you know, again, administratively simpler, um, increasing you know, like you said, the payroll tax on high income earners, uh, broadening the base of payroll taxes as well probably makes some sense. Um, and then, yeah, like converting converting the current trust fund into a diversified index uh, would make a lot more sense than just putting everything into treasuries. I mean, that's one thing that, you know, you it's funny that you'll hear you'll hear a lot of conservatives that will make that argument. They'll say, this is ridiculous that we give money to Social Security because I, it only gets 2% return because all they invest in is treasuries. I, I'm a smart investor. I could take that money and make 28% because I put it all into Bitcoin. It's like, okay, dumbass, whatever you want to say. However, the point that you're making is fundamentally sound, which is the idea that, you know, the Social Security Administration should invest in more than just treasuries, right? And and it, it pretty much it's it's kind of a weird kind of an odd constraint that that's the only thing that they can do with their surplus. Um, and that would, you know, that would, that would increase the return of the fund from, you know, 2% to 4.5%, 6%, you know, on a, on a given year. And, you know, it would be more sustainable. This is what a lot of other countries already do. Like a lot of other countries, pension funds already do this, right? Um, this is what every single city, like there's no city, there's no city level pension fund for the most part that doesn't invest in anything but municipal bonds, right? The state level pension funds don't do the same thing. Other pension funds for federal workers don't do that. Like the USPS pension fund, they, they you know, that's a diversified portfolio. And so it doesn't make sense not to do the same thing for social security as well. I mean, one thing that somebody in the chat mentions is that, uh, oh, you know, sovereign wealth fund social security has been a GOP proposal for years. While that is true, it, it's true that it's ironically, a lot of the pushback you get on that is from like really, really, really fucking stupid Democrats and like democratic socialist Democrat types who will say, oh, um, well, we're just going to give all that money to Wall Street. You just want to give a bunch of money to Wall Street. Is that right? It's like, OK, dumbass, listen, that's the people's wealth. I don't know what you think socialism is, but when you take a shitload of public money and invest it into, you know, like capital, you're socializing capital when you're doing that. Like, yeah, if you privately manage it out, you might, you know, end up in a scenario where you you're you're paying 
you know, 0.2% of the capital gain to some fund manager. But I don't know. I feel like socializing trillions of dollars of capital is probably a socialist goal that, you know, you'd think was a good <laughs> idea. I, I just, it frustrates the shit out. No, because the, the guy points out a real thing, because I've heard that for years, is, oh, they're trying to let private investors get social security money. They're trying to let you gamble on social security. And it's like, bro. What a privatization. Like, they tell me, tell me, tell me you don't know shit about finance or economics without telling me you don't know shit about finance or economics. Saying some shit like that, man, that triggers the hell out of me because it's a really good proposal. So I will just say on the, on the chain CPI thing, um, I think what, what I've heard argued is that chain CPI probably is a better measure of inflation for the general public, but not for the elderly because, it, because healthcare costs are rising much faster than inflation and they make up a huge portion of the elderly's budget. So like, Insofar as like like just to be clear, I think mechanically what we're really doing when we're talking about CPI is we're taking like a tiny budget cut and like you like that's like that's fine. We can just propose a tiny budget cut if like that's what's necessary for fiscal sustainability. I just don't know that it's necessarily true that it's like the most accurate measure of elders um, oh, elders there, consumption. There's like CPI E right, which is like uh, the CPI for elderly people, and Bernie's proposed that. This is an example where I think like Bernie's just doing like one of those. I want to increase spending on everything. He he's he's um, you know said he wants to raise social security benefits for everybody in a way mm -hmm. that would just lead to a huge problem for us because we wouldn't be able to fund anything else. But but I think that if you're gonna do you want to do a small across the board cut, that is the right way to use it. I think we should do CPI e for uh, CPI change CPI for everything. Um, and I think that when it comes to healthcare, that's an absolutely good point. That's the main reason why CPI, CPIE, and chain CPI or chain CPI and CPIE are going to be so different. Um, but I think we'd all agree that. Um, well, and I think this is the argument that if you want to reduce that, maybe the solution is about other reductions in the U.S. healthcare system, like negotiating drug prices down, funding basic research ideally, and increasing production and reforming IP law to increase drug production. Like, there's a lot of other things to reduce healthcare costs. Exactly. That would actually exactly. therefore reduce social spending and, and uh, reducing like reducing insurance premiums for Medicare, expanding Medicare's coverage. Right. So you're like you're not paying for all these different things because, you know, pet, Medicare Part D premiums are high. Med, Medigap premiums are high. And I imagine these are like the things that are really kind of contributing at, to the to the um, acceleration of the cost of living for elderly people ex, uh, relative to other elements of the population. Yeah. yeah. So I just so we agree. The true, wow. the true way, the true way to reduce um, social security spending is simply to make drugs cheap as hell. Um, yeah. Clearly, this is what Micah says. We, though Micah wants to like abolish the FDA. I think. Well, to it makes sense because I mean the thing is like again, this is almost like one of the foundational messages of this podcast, right? Is that we're talking about fiscal sustainability here. There, there's no reason a socialist and a hyper capitalist couldn't agree on like, in terms of the spectrum, you know, between those extreme ends and anywhere in between, there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to agree on things like that. That's why it's so frustrating for me when I hear somebody say, I'm a democratic socialist, I'm a politician who's a democratic socialist. And they say, my democratic socialism is when we expand social security benefits and we deficit spend to do so. It's like, okay, but that's not, there's, there's nothing about that. That's, there's nothing collective, there's no collective ownership that's being increased or decreased. When you do that, there's no socialization of capital. There's no socialization of rents. Um, it's just bad. It's like, it's like, um, uh, it's like a Yende socialism, right? Where he like increased subsidies for a bunch of shit and like increased minimum wages and stuff. It's not that in a vacuum, a lot of those things are bad. It's just that when you tell me something like I'm a democratic socialist, that's why I think that we should not have a, basically a wealth fund management system for social security. It's like, bro, it sounds like you don't know what socialism is. And it sounds like you don't understand how to like properly sustain your fiscal state, right? I mean, there's just not I, an I incompatibility between these two things, right? The, the fairness that I'll offer to this is that I think a lot of it comes from skepticism of like GOP proposals in general. Like I, when I first heard of DBCFT, I was like, let me look this up. I think the first like six results were from conservative blogs. And I was like, what, what the hell is happening here? Um, yeah. But you know, looking into it, it does seem to be more solid on the merits. So I, I just, I think there's reasonable skepticism in the same way that GOP -er might be skeptical of every, every proposal for like a land value tax was from like a socialist blog or whatever. They'd be like, what the, what the hell is going on? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, it's just important I, for people when they think about like, it, it's obviously going to depend on how you approach policy, right? Um, if you approach policy from like an incredibly ideologically attached perspective, I mean, that's the frustrating thing about the socialist arguments is like, bro, even if you're like a hardline fucking socialized all capital socialist, 
you should still agree with these fiscal reforms because in theory we're just approaching these yeah, reforms we, with like whatever works the best. Of the way there. Yeah, exactly, like, right? I mean, and so it, you know, it's 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 just you sh you should always you should never really approach in, in my view at least like you should never approach how do I put this? My ideology is based on my basic moral intuitions and the policies that get us there. And when I basket all those together and I see, okay, what's my ideal society look like based on what I think are the best outcomes? Oh, I end up being a social democrat, right? I don't like start from the premise, I'm a social democrat, therefore I believe in these certain policies. Now, a lot of people do the first, they, they, they do the latter, right? Where they'll be like, I'm That's a socialist, right. therefore I believe in these things. But it's like that, really it should be the exact opposite. Anyway, that's a bit of a rant. Michael, what were you going to say? But I mean, like you're absolutely right. I mean, it just it just I think this podcast proves that you can be like, you know, on different parts of the political spectrum. We're both on, you know, left of center. SDL is probably on the more further left side. I'm probably on the more center left side. But in terms of mechanisms, in, in terms of policy instruments, there can be mostly agreement because it's just true that certain like the government is being inefficient across all these domains. And there's more efficient ways to do all these things. And then we might disagree. OK, like how high should the DBS CFT be? How high should your, you know, now modified perfect income tax be? How much, how much should the UBI be? Uh, you know, sh how much should the state ownership be? But we won't disagree about how the state ownership should be structured. Wait, right? Vor in the chat so says, hold on. Vor in the chat says, DBCFT, Social Security. Oh fuck, hold on, I just missed it. Let me go to the, the 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 chat updated so no, I, can't I can see read it, it off. So yeah, the voter says, I want DBCFT, Social Security Wealth Funds, and Texas tax policy over California tax policy. Yeah, I'm in the GOP, Guardians of the Proletariat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.